Marubini is unwell. He's on his way to see Madula, whose medicines and treatments are known to cure and to heal, and whose words of advice to restore a man's mind to tranquility. Madula is a herbalist. The function of a diviner is to make predictions and to interpret, among other things, the reasons for a client's illness or other misfortune. In other words, a diviner has to establish whether the client's illness or misfortune is due to the anger of the ancestors or to the insidious activities of a sorcerer or witch. Now this is an important function, except it is merely the first step in the right direction, because ultimately a client must feel free of misfortune and must be given the necessary protection against possible future harm. Now the next step means a visit to a herbalist. Whereas the function of a diviner is to make contact with the spirit world on behalf of a client, this is not really the function of a herbalist. His real function is to provide curative indigenous medicines for illnesses and protective medicines and charms for general misfortune. Some herbalists possess an astounding knowledge in indigenous medicines, having served lengthy apprenticeships under the tutelage of a mentor. Some of them prefer to specialize, and they may specialize in providing protective medicines and charms for households where death has occurred or where lightning has struck. So although herbalists and diviners perform different services, there is, however, an overlap. So it's not entirely uncommon for a herbalist to have insight into divination and for a diviner to practice certain aspects of herbalism. Fever accounts for many aches and pains. To alleviate this, appropriate indigenous medicines are made into an ointment or a paste, or may be ground into a powder. Various methods are used for applying these remedies. Okay. In a purely tribal society, all medicines are derived from the raw materials available in the environment. On the one hand, these may be roots, bulbs, tubers, the bark of certain trees, leaves, berries, and fruits, all of which may have therapeutic properties. On the other hand, there may be vegetable and animal matter which have no therapeutic properties whatsoever, but are essentially magical. There are literally hundreds of indigenous medicines which are derived from vegetable matter and serve as emetics, laxatives, painkillers, and so on. Indigenous medicines are available not only in tribal areas, but also in towns and cities. This plant is found in many parts of southern Africa from the Cape to the Limpopo and westwards into Botswana. Now when it has been dug out, it is left in the sun to dry and then the sheaths 
are stripped off and used for dressing and bandaging uh, wounds. Now I have a dry one here. The sheaths are soft and silky in texture. And they're always in great demand, especially during circumcision time, when wounds are particularly tender and painful. These are the roots of a shrub known as impila. They are exceptionally poisonous, but if taken sparingly, make an outstanding laxative and are excellent for getting rid of tapeworms. Not more than a mere pinch of impila boiled up in a mug of water is necessary for doing the trick. But should an overdose be taken, it can lead to excessive vomiting and even to death. In the last century, and to a certain extent in recent decades, peoples living along the east coast of southern Africa have been prone to scrofula. Now, the symptoms of scrofula are glandular swelling, uh, skin sores, listlessness, and stomach disorders. But tribal herbalists have long had an excellent remedy for scrofula. It is the bark of a tree known as umatanjana. And umatanjana is believed to be outstanding as a curative remedy. And it is also believed to be unsurpassed as a blood purifier. Now here is something which I find especially interesting. Workers in the fields often suffer from backache and pains in the joints. And to alleviate this, the roots of Sakulamanye are thoroughly ground into a powder and rubbed into incisions cut into the affected parts. Now I can vouch for the efficacy of Sakulamanye because a few years ago I was researching in the region of the Nkandla forest in KwaZulu and coming down the hill slope one evening I stumbled and twisted my ankle rather badly and it was swollen and very painful. The same night I was visited by a herbalist who lived close by and he insisted on cutting an incision into my ankle and rubbing in a powder called Sakulamanye. Now the next morning when I got up there was no trace of pain and no trace of swelling. It could be argued that this would have happened in any case, but I doubt it. By contrast, the magical medicines have no therapeutic value whatsoever, as I've already said, but are largely symbolic. They are selected on the basis that the characteristics of certain plants and animals provide man with the same characteristics. Let me explain a little further. There are roots which are hard and tough and drought resistant. And if they turn into charms, they are likely to give a man that same feeling of toughness. There are twigs that are taken from plants that grow along the roadways. And if they are turned into charms, they are likely to help the traveler on his way. And the charm daubed with the flesh of a mongoose, which shows tremendous courage in fighting snakes, will give a man and especially a timid man, the courage he so urgently needs. This stick has been fixed to the ground for a very special reason. It has been daubed with protective medicines, and it's believed that if a sorcerer were to come here during the night and try and enter this village, he would be fixed to the ground, and the next morning, the village owner would find him here and punish him. Morana Muroto. Charms may also be worn around the neck, like this one. And the protective medicines are kept in a little bottle. They may also be kept in little horns. And here's a particularly good example of a medicine horn. The owner of this charm had dreadful trouble with crocodiles near the Black Mfulosi River in Guazulu. His little daughter had been rather badly bitten by a crocodile. And so, not only he, but also his wife and the little daughter 
and their two other children had to wear charms like this. Now, charms may also be worn around the wrist. The owner of this charm had lost his wife, and shortly after the tragedy, lightning struck one of his huts, so he hurried off to see a medicine man who gave him this charm to protect him against further misfortune. Perhaps the most commonly known method of divination is the ancient craft of throwing the bones. It is practiced among most tribal groups in southern Africa. The items that make up a diviner set may number no more than a dozen or as many as 60. And although no two sets are ever identical, and although interpretations may vary from diviner to diviner according to their individualities, the fundamentals are similar. Now, bones fall mainly into two categories. They are the ankle bones and the knuckle bones. And each bone, and in fact all items that make up a set, have many connotations uh, representing a large spectrum of people, of situations, and moods. So let's have a look at some of these bones. The lion. Well, the lion is the king of the beast. So this bone could represent a king, a chief, a headman, even an employer, seniority, authority, and other connotations. The hyena follows the lion around. And the hyena is inclined to be a bit of a yes man because when the lion roars, it chuckles. Where the lion eats, it will eat the leftovers. And so it does, in fact, represent yes men, sycophants. And it also implies duplicity and intrigue. The bone of the ant bear. Well, the ant bear is a nocturnal animal, and it also lives under the ground. So it does suggest gloomy things. Death, widowhood, burial, mourning, but also with the ancestral spirits. Now, the monkey, well, naturally, this would be guile, agility, cunning. And the bone of the bush pig. Well, the bush pig is forever digging with its snout in the mud in search of edible plants and roots and tubers. Well, that is exactly what a herbalist does. And so this could tell us about health and also about diviners, medicine men, herbalists and others. The stone that comes out of a crocodile's stomach. Now, a crocodile in some parts is regarded as a vile creature. And so this, this has to do with defilement, with death, with evil, with sorcery and witchcraft. Now, how do all these items go into action, as it were? Well, this depends not only on the directions in which they fall in relation to each other, but also whether they fall in a standing position or upside down. Now, should a bone fall on its feet in a convex position, it means it is mobile and that some action is likely to take place very soon. This could be good or it could be very bad. You see, if it means that a chief is soon to honor the client, well, this is good news. But if it means that the chief is soon to punish the client, this is bad news. In the same way, if a bone were to fall on its back in a concave position, this could be equally good or equally bad. It means that it is immobile and that action will be taking some time. Now, this applies to all the items in a diviner set, bringing all the meanings into action and adding the final interpretations in accordance not only 
with the directions in which they point in relation to each other, but also in relation to the central figure, to the client himself, who is likely to be represented in this case by the bone of a goat. In the northern reaches of southern Africa, among the Benda, the Tsonga, the Karanga and other tribal groups, the bones and other items that make up a diviner set include four flat pieces made of bone or wood, which we call divining dice for want of another word. They are distinctively marked for identification. For example, this one represents a mature man or an elderly man. This one, a mature or elderly woman. This one, a young man, and that one, a young woman. Sometimes they represent man and his wife, his son and his daughter. Now in Sekakuni land, there are similar divining dice which work on the similar principle, except that they are differently shaped and differently designed. Now, as in the case of the bones and other items that belong to a diviner set, interpretation with uh, the divining dice depends not only on the directions in which they fall in relation to each other, but whether they fall face upwards or down. What really makes interpretation with divining dice a little difficult is that they can fall into any of 16 different combinations. For example, they can fall all facing up, or three facing up and one down, or two up and two down, or one up and three down, or all facing down. Now, those are five of the combinations which means there are 11 more. No wonder apprenticeship to divination can take up to three years, and demanding of a diviner the deepest concentration and a rather extraordinary memory. <laughs> divination, magic, and witchcraft, the supernatural. Elements that are deeply interwoven in the fabric of tribal life. It's all part of the ancient wisdom of Africa. Wisdom that has been handed down from generation to generation over the centuries. The world of the diviner embraces a host of extraordinary elements, some of which seemingly defy everyday scientific explanation. This trellis-like instrument is known as Makonyane, and it is used by diviners in the more northerly reaches of southern Africa. In olden times, it was used for smelling out witches and sorcerers, but today it is used mainly for tracking down thieves, or for locating stolen cattle, or for finding lost property of any description. The Makonyana is daubed with special medicine said to have magical properties. It is also said to be controlled by the diviner's ancestral spirit, his guiding spirit. Now, a client would come along to the diviner and report, say, that his cattle have been stolen. So the diviner would tell him to sit down opposite him. The diviner would then speak to the to guiding spirit and he would say, Raditaba, if that was his name. Raditaba, Raditaba, our friend has come for help. Now, Raditaba, will you be with us today? If so, come to us and show us. Now, Raditaba, before we start, just show us where our friend lives. Where his huts are, Raditaba? Ah. 
Now, Raditaba, the man who stole the cattle, where does he live? Where are his huts? There. Now, Raditaba, I'm sure he no longer stays there. He's run away. Where has he gone, Raditaba? In which direction has he run? In that direction. Now, in demonstrating very, very concisely how the Mokonyana works, I'm sure it doesn't look very evidential. But it must be remembered that in the true situation, it's not the diviner who holds Mokonyana, but his client who has every opportunity of manipulating it or trying to prevent it from moving this way or that. And in this way, the client has the best opportunity of judging whether the Mokonyana is evidential or not. Chabalala, a popular and widely known diviner who lives to the north of Petersburg. At his village, a strange and remarkable ceremony is taking place. The reason? A patient is said to have been possessed by an unknown spirit. The phenomenon of possession has been unknown to people south of the Limpopo River until relatively recent times. What happens is that certain women, and to a lesser extent men, suddenly start behaving in an unfamiliar manner, becoming strangely ill, feeling nauseous, feverish, and becoming subject to spells of dizziness and unconsciousness, which may mean that they've been possessed by an unknown spirit which has to be pacified and ultimately removed. Among the Venda and Tsonga of the northern Transvaal, when a case of possession occurs, a medicine man is summoned to verify the condition. And then special drums are beaten. The idea being to summon the patient's relatives and friends, and in fact, everyone who has experienced possession before. And they all dance together to the rhythm of rattling tambourines, the medicine man always leading the throng. Slowly the control of the possessing spirit increases. Hence the quickening of the tempo of the music to counteract its influence and alleviate the strain brought to bear on the patient. Meanwhile, the patient has been placed in a hut somewhat bewildered by her fate and all the confusion around her. In due course, she will be visited by the medicine man who will daub her body with medicines and then bring her out into the open to take part in the dance. And there she will dance and dance for many hours until eventually she drops with exhaustion. At that moment, the possessing spirit is expected to identify himself to name himself by using the patient's vocal cords. And should this happen, the patient is given medicine to drink, a new regalia to wear, and she re-enters the dance, where again she will dance until eventually she collapses a second time, which means that the possessing spirit has left forever. It also means that the patient is about to enter a new life with new status and it also means when similar happenings occur in the future she will be invited to officiate. Chabalala seeks to prove his powers, to show he is oblivious to pain, insensitive to physical suffering as a result of his unflagging faith. 
This leaves an indelible impression on the minds of his patients and followers. It is a display which serves to capture their trust and confidence. Wonderland and an unusual method of healing. Here the diviner uses a doll-like figure made of a calabash which contains the spirit of his guiding ancestor. Through it he receives a message from the ancestor and is therefore able to diagnose the patient's ailment. <laughs> The water serves an important function. It is sanctified water, and because it is claimed to have healing properties, it is avidly drunk by the patient. One form of healing is not often seen, and is rather uncanny to witness. It is known as sedimu among the pedi, and entails the transferring of ailments and diseases of humans into animals. As can be imagined, this form of healing is practiced by the most highly specialized medicine men and is regarded as so exotic, so extraordinary and so totally mystifying as to place them in the very highest brackets of prestige. Briefly, what happens is that the moment a medicine man has diagnosed his patient's illness, this is transferred into a goat or a sheep which incidentally has been put into a state of sleep. And this is what I find so extraordinary. In all the years that I've seen this done, the only animals I've ever seen used have been goats or sheep. The goat is in some sort of hypnotic state and the patient breathes into its nostrils, thereby transferring the symptoms of his ailments into the animal system. At no time does the goat wake up. I personally investigated this, prodding, tugging at the animal, but it continued to sleep throughout the ceremony. The goat is slaughtered. The illness transferred to it has now been negated. Incidentally, the young boy is the medicine man's son and in receiving apprenticeship training from his father is being prepared for the day when he himself will go into practice. Finally, the medicine man's assistant is beaten, symbolizing the removal of all trace of the patient's illness. The question is often asked whether the diviners are genuine, whether their predictions come true, and whether their interpretations are evidential. Are diviners perhaps not astute observers who gather information about their clients in order to hoodwink them and thereby gain their confidence? Well, as I've said before, they are frauds in many walks of life, but generally speaking, they don't survive for very long. And this applies especially, I would say, to divination. Because no one would accept nonsensical evidence indefinitely. People talk among themselves. So if a diviner were to be consistently inaccurate, he would find himself out of business. But the mere fact that there are many diviners who have been in practice for over 20 years indicates, as I see it, 
that their clients have found their services satisfactory. I believe there is more to divination than is sometimes thought. Oh, my God.